I was exposed to pornography when I was four years old, and uh, I was sexually abused from the age of four uh, up to about the age of 16. Because I was raised in an Irish Catholic family, it was something that was really, really shameful, and we never talked about it. So it went underground, and I never had anyone to process any of that with. And I developed this deeply internalized sense of shame, which is not just that I had done something bad, but that I was bad, not that I had done something wrong, but that I was wrong. I saw myself as a deeply, deeply flawed person. Uh, by the grace of God, I came to a personal relationship with Jesus when I was 16 years old, and that was a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, I came to define being a Christian by being somebody who looked really good on the outside. So all of the hiddenness that was in my life went even deeper inside. And one day I went to a, a, a youth leader and confessed that I was struggling with sexual sin and lust and uh, that I'd even been sexually abused. And this person had said, well, you're a new creation in Christ and that's behind you and you shouldn't have to deal with that anymore. And in one brushstroke, in one conversation, I realized I will never tell anyone about that again. And uh, the longer uh, that I lived with those sins, the deeper they became and the more compulsive they became. And so as I got older and the longer I became a Christian, there were really these two parts of me. There was this part of me that was the good Christian man, and there was this part of me that was this compulsive, addicted man who was acting out sexually, who was uh, drinking, and eventually I developed an, uh, a problem with alcohol, I became an alcoholic, and the two of those went together. And uh, that was really very, very, very hidden until that day in 1994. I came home from work one day and I was in ministry and uh, my wife asked me a basic question. And when I answered that question wrong, she said, that's not what you said before. And I started to fumble over my words and the blood drained out of my face and my heart started racing inside of me. And what uh, happened was over the next 48 hours, a whole life of double lies un unfolded. And it was the worst day of my life because it was utterly, utterly, utterly heartbreaking and devastating for my wife. Um, but it was a time of exposure for me and a time of being uh, totally, totally broken and found out. I was finally known for who I really was. And that was the first time in my life that I believe that I've been totally um, straightforward, where everyone knew everything about me, that there was nothing hidden. My struggle back then was that I had a hard time connecting the reality of the gospel, the good news of Christ, with the reality of my broken life. And it wasn't until everything came apart and I was desperate that those two worlds really connected. And a lot of men, we, we do what Dallas Willard calls, uh, we practice the gospel of sin management. And God doesn't want us to manage our sins. He wants us to be transformed and to really set free. Jesus said he came to bind up our broken hearts and to set captives free. And I think things like porn, sexual addiction, all kinds of addictions, all of our brokenness is simply an opportunity to know Christ more deeply and it's an opportunity to have our hearts made whole and an opportunity to become free. Unfortunately, the way we talk about it in the church and the way that most Christian leaders live is that our brokenness is a, uh, is a barrier to knowing God and to loving others. And so we have to push it down, we have to hide it, uh, we really can't acknowledge it. According to the gospel, I believe, there's nothing that can't be redeemed and there's nothing that can't actually become a bridge to knowing God and loving others. If you look at the larger story of Scripture from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, what you have is not a book that tells you how to go to heaven. And part of what's happened with the evangelical church in probably the last hundred years is that the gospel, the good news, the amazing story of God and who he is and what he wants to do in our life and in our world, that's been compromised to this message that uh, Jesus died on the cross for my sins and we go to heaven and that's it. And the gospel is so much more than that. Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and restoring us to God so that we can go to heaven, that's just the beginning. That's just a door that we walk through. And so the good news, which is the message of the Bible, is about the fact that you can be restored to God through Christ, that you can become a son or daughter of the living God, and that you can become restored, that you can become a whole person. It's interesting that if you look at Luke chapter four, uh, it's Jesus' very first sermon. It says that he was in the desert being tempted by the devil. He says he's full of the Holy Spirit and he goes to his hometown. And he walks into the temple and it wasn't just grab bag uh, scripture day, but, but the Hebrew liturgical calendar 
uh, arranged it so that he would walk in on this particular day and read this particular text. And it wasn't a text that said, I have come to die on the cross for your sins. It wasn't John 3.16. It was Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus' first words, and you would think that his first words would hold special significance to the heart of God and what he's about. Jesus said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He's anointed me for this. Here's my mission, so to speak, um, to, to bind up the broken heart, to set captives free, to take everything that's wrong, so to speak, and to make it right. I think that's something that's compelling and attractive for a person who's not a believer. And a lot of people just see the Bible as a book of rules, but it's a love story that says you can be restored. You can be forgiven. You can be made new. You can be restored. I'm living proof of that.